Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, Dagmar uh, graduated uh, in music as well at the Conservatoire of uh, the City of Vienna on piano and composition, but today uh, we will enjoy her other talents, so to say. She is a professor of uh, psychology and uh, studied psychology, physiology, cultural anthropology, philosophy at the University of uh, Vienna. Uh, currently, she is a professor for medical anthropology at the Medical University of Vienna and uh, she's a psychotherapist, clinical and health psychologist. Um, it would be easier to list those parts of the world where she had not run <laughs> field work <laughs> because she really did extensive field work uh, in many places like, for instance, uh, South and Southeast Asia, Siberia, North Africa, Cuba, China, and uh, many other places um, on the world, and she led uh, numerous ethno-psychological and anthropological photo and video projects. Uh, currently, she is the president of the Australia Society for Medical Anthropology. We are really curious about your presentation. Please take. So, thank you very much, Kata, for your really nice uh, introduction of me. Um, so. What I want to tell you now really fits in very smoothly what Barbara told, and I want to remind you that uh, shamanism or shamanic practices are really the first and very basic form of art and music therapy. And it still can use that as this in today. So my focus will be on the uh, multi-sense experiences, stimulating all uh, sensory systems, and then also on rhythm and resonance, and of course you know, on the um, active participation of uh, people in the ritual. So it's not only the shaman or the healer or whatever, or some you know active uh, persons of bigger rituals, but it's very important that all um, people who are taking part, even just visitors by chance, are integrated and take active part in the whole thing so that it will be benefit all of the people there and for their uh, health and, and also act as a prevention. In Nepal, there still is a, is a saying that everyone knows that says there is no expert shaman who cannot sing and dance well. So it's already the focus of uh, the importance of uh, singing, dancing. And um, uh, this in, in the uh, early descriptions of uh, shamanism in Northern Europe and uh, Siberia, like in the 17th and 18th uh, century accounts, there was this performative aspect that was immediately noticed, of course, and that, that has been commented in all of the description, early descriptions of shamanism. So here in this famous book, Laponia by Schäferus, it also, this etching shows uh, the performative uh, character and, and the, the shaman and the patients are involved, but also people around. So it's also important for, be for family members and, and or visitors or whatever to take part. And um, this also, this uh, sometimes these wild performances uh, that were described, you know, from the beginning of the shamanic studies. Uh, and uh, this was very unusual to what um, in Central Europe we were used and then what would be considered as uh, scientific for us. And it is, of course, uh, due to differences in the worldview and the concept of the persons. I maybe make another remark of that later. And this what was described first as ecstasy, you know, just being out of yourself, really wild, you know. Um, and this term was frequently used for the state of the mind of the shaman, but of course also the patients go in, enter, and all the, the participants enter altered states of consciousness. 
And also these descriptions were probably the reason why the shamans, you know, they were for a long time considered as uh, being mentally ill, you know, and there's almost no term, you know, in the diagnostic manual that, that were not projected on the shamans. Of course, this discussion has finished now, but there is still something because they act so unusual, you know. Uh, and so this is one group uh, of um, shamans in Nepal today. So you also see their uh, beautifully designed costumes, you know, their drums, their necklaces with bells, you know, who also when they uh, move or dance, who also start to, to cling. So it's, um, for many shamans, it's the, the two rhythms, you know, the rhythm, the beating of the drum and the clinging of bells or other metal elements that are slightly, um, with a slight uh, latency of the uh, beating of the drum, and this is what we call in music therapy inherent pattern, that it's not synchronous, and this also has specific therapeutic effects. It's much more effective than if you just have uh, the, the synchronized, you know. And just one more comment on the scientific basis or the context now, that this was especially the age of the enlightenment, the Aufklärung, you know, with its focus on rationality, uh, that uh, shamanic performances were somehow derogated and, and they were put down and seen as magic, not rational, therefore not the scientific and even not, you know, uh, taken serious as a subject of scientific research and investigation. And in the last decades, the study of consciousness and of altered states of consciousness uh, has uh, really expanded much and it took a new interest in traditional healing methods like shamanic therapy, for example, because now we see it really as a potential for better understanding of the human mind, especially what's happening in altered states of consciousness and the potentials that are there for changing, for healing, for transformations, and also to get a better understanding for personal development. And then, of course, we want to design new therapies for the benefit of the people. So, uh, these uh, multidisciplinary studies of consciousness and, and all the states of consciousness were one reason behind that why they are now of much more interest is because it has been seen and understood that uh, they are very powerful, that traditional healing practices are very powerful techniques to induce altered states of consciousness and to work with these altered states of consciousness. Like in hypnosis, for example, I mean, you have this very rich tradition in working with that. And uh, they're seeing the benefits in different scientific fields, like, for example, neurophysiology and neurology, and uh, better understanding of the human mind, the human brain, but not only the anatomical or physiological side, but also other sides. And of course, now there's really a strong focus on prevention, and that can be achieved with these uh, techniques also very well. The shamanic drumming can be in quite different patterns or frequencies, the drumming, but it has been shown that in almost all the cultures uh, where there is a strong shamanic tradition in the world, uh, they usually uh, use a, a frequency of four to seven beats per second. And this uh, one electroencephalographic study by Andrew Neher, it's really quite old now, but it has become very, very famous and it's really speaking by itself. And it is assumed that in the drums, the rhythmic um, beating, drum beating of four to five beats per second is employed because they are particularly powerful to induce altered states of consciousness. And it was found that in the EG, there were theta waves also with frequency four to seven hertz, and usually they are not present in the normal waking state. So with these techniques, we can produce EEG patterns that usually we only find in the sleep state. 
Um, but not all the traditional healers uh, use the drum. Uh, for example, in Nepal, uh, there's a very rich tradition of mediums, mediums of local deities usually. They do not have a drum because it's not their tradition, but they work in similar ways. And they produce these rhythms that are the same kind of rhythms with different ways. Some have a lot of metal objects, so they start shaking. Uh, which is also seen as a, as a sign that they get in contact with the spiritual world, you know, but it's also technique, if you want to say that. And the singing, which is again the same, you know, frequency pattern. And um, they, of course, it puts themselves, their healers, into altered states of consciousness, but all the people who are present, because this is the sensory input, what people hear, but also what they see. So now you have two sensory modalities. And uh, it also takes, it, it integrates the whole audience, whoever is present there, into the whole actions. So it's, um, they also become active members because there is a lot of them going on. And I have attended many healing rituals in, I mean, especially many in, in Nepal. And there I then often talked with people about it. So why are you here? You know, because they were not treated as patients. And they said, oh, wow, you see, I have uh, yeah, some problems maybe in the family or with my boss or whatever. So, but I don't consider myself as really being ill or, or, or sick. But when I come here and this whole thing, the whole atmosphere of what's going on, it helps me to get into a better state of mind and to solve my, my problems than are getting solved. And usually this also creates, the sensory input creates uh, a very special atmosphere and people are very deeply moved um, by this at atmosphere during the rituals. Um, the mediums in Nepal, for example, I, I said they're uh, usually mediums of local goddesses, but especially the female mother goddesses. They're very important. And this mother figure, you know, represented by the female deity, this mother figure is a strong figure who can take care of all the problems, subdue the enemies, you know. Of course, there are also loving, you know, figures who they really take care of, of the people. But basically, the most important aspect is that they are very strong, you know, and this then goes on, I mean, through the mediums, to the mediums, but also to all the audience, not only the patients. And this is what they feel, this being taken care of by this mother figure and, and the strength. And now with that, in union with that uh, powerful figure, they can deal with their problems in a much better way. The interesting thing is that there are some male mediums also. There, most of them are females, but there are male mediums. And they are also addressed as mother, because they are mediums of the mother deities, mother, mata. And an important aspect is the merging with the spiritual powers. And the spiritual components enhances the feeling of care and connectedness. You know? And um, so all the healers, uh, they uh, uh, get into connection, but through them, all the other people's people also. So it's experiencing the mother, the mata, the Sanskrit word, or matrika, also a Sanskrit word, or matrix. You know? And we also speak in, in, in medicine of the, the matrix that is somehow the, the uh, ur, you know, thing that, that we all are embedded in, in, in the end. You know? Matrix, in the med as a medical term, is also something a bit more specific. But matrix, this word, is one term that now comes up more and more also, especially in the context of a holistic worldview, you know, that this matrix that is, of course, 
identical with the mother, with the mother deity, and that this is also very important for us to get reconnected with or connected with. Also some psychotherapists, some modern psychotherapists refer to that term, sort of uh, uh, giving the patients the feeling of this connectedness with the matrix. But also, of course, this connection with the spiritual powers is uh, one point of critique by the hardcore scientists. Um, and, uh, but, but, and, and uh, modern Western uh, science, I mean, not all of it, but most part of it, is very uh, culture-centered, it's Euro-centered, or I mean, United States, although North America also. And so everything is looked on from their point of view. And that's our rational science and research. Vincent Carpanzano, who is an American ethno-psychiatrist, and he has been really done a lot of work in, in the ethnographic accounts of, of healing, um, uh, cultural uh, societies, and he says that the ethnographer's act of translating what is considered self-evident by the members of any particular cultural tradition may resemble bizarre, exotic, or downright irrational what would have been ordinary in its own context. And I think this is very important to reflect also, and especially now our societies now are becoming more and more multi-ethnic, so if you want to do therapy, also really consider the basic worldview also. And um, in, in Asian philosophical uh, tradition, there uh, are three big cultures uh, who have developed the non-dual worldview, this is Advaita Vedanta in India, the, the Tao in, in, in China, and, and the Mahayana Buddhism. So when it says we are all one, everything is one, there is no schism between one person and another. Like you and me, we are basically one, and we are part of the whole one. And these are... Uh, really have very um, extensive philosophical traditions based on written traditions. I mean, there are just many rooms, mountains full on literature of these traditions. So if we are dealing with people from other cultures, you know, and doing therapy, I think we have to pay respect and also look at their um, worldview and concept of the person. What do they want? Um, so I will now give a few examples of group rituals because these uh, community rituals, uh, there uh, these features can be shown especially well, this multi-sensory design um, and, and also the, the part that also the per participants play, the active part. And these community rituals, they're often very big, up to hundreds of people. Uh, often they take place at specific sacred sites or special community sites like the, the center of the village or like that. They last at least several hours, often several days or for a whole week. And there, as I mentioned, the multi-sense design is especially pronounced. This is one uh, Buddhist uh, community ritual in Nepal for a place of worship in the middle of the forest, which was really very nice and, and has a very nice atmosphere. And the term communitas uh, was coined by Victor Turner. He is uh, one or was one of the very important um, researchers, uh, ethnologists uh, who worked on ritual research. And he said uh, that in this center part of these kinds of rituals, and he calls it the liminal phase because it is the limen, you know, where I go from one state to another, for example, from illness to health, or the community rituals from winter to spring, where all the environment then changes. And he says that in this you know, state, uh, uh, there is communitas, and he means a state of equality of all the people without hierarchy of everyday life. 
And this also creates special conditions, different those in everyday life uh, and the structure of society. And in these conditions are really uh, very good for um, letting uh, arise changes in the whole community or in individual persons or changes in the relationships. And his, one of his famous book is called Structure and Antistructure. With antistructure, he means this uh, state of communitas with equality, but here antistructure doesn't mean without any structure, structure less, but it means different than in everyday life. And here is uh, also another ritual in Nepal, and I don't know if you can see it well, uh, but all the people, they sit in a circle and they are connected, I mean in one, in the center phase of the ritual, by a thread that they hold in their hands. And everyone is invited for that. I mean, beggars who come along, outsiders like me, who are not part of their society. So it really says we are all one all come, and no matter what hierarchy in everyday life, now it is different. In, I have uh, also uh, studied some community rituals in Austria, and um, I noticed that uh, now there is this program of the UNESCO, the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, means immaterial cu cultural heritage, and um, so many kinds of rituals, like this, many of community rituals um, are listed, you know, by the UNESCO. But the thing is that they are only seen as uh, a cultural tradition, and the function of it, no one really cares about it. And actually, not much research has been done. You know, now it's slowly starting that more people are getting interested. Because, I mean, traditional healing is a large part of this immaterial culture. And, and so, like in, in one of the, the community rituals, which is a winter exorcism ritual that I have uh, visited uh, last year in January in the Tyrol. And there, there was nothing of that communitas. On the contrary, there was a VIP section that was elevated and only specific people could go up there and the rest of the people were down and were envious looking up to those because the VIPs were the only one who really had a good sight of the whole thing, you know. So this is, uh, from the, the, the function of, of this community ritual, this is counterproductive, you know. But because it is not understood, okay. Uh, so there are these many activities that take place, uh, sometimes really very spontaneous. And here you see also the, the, the people, all the people who take very active parts and they're invited for that, but they can do whatever they want. And at some of the big rituals, there are music groups invited and then there's some dancing, but no must, everyone does what he or she wants. And also the common meal, you know, sometimes the cook at this place and so other sensory modalities, the smell, the taste, and then um, here the common meal and that involves all five sensory systems and there also everyone is invited. And then uh, at, towards the end there's this uh, consecration uh, by the ritual specialists, uh, all the people who wanted to receive holy water, so again, the modality of taste, flower, sacred ashes, now here we come to the tactile um, modality, and uh, in this uh, ritual, which was really very big, and I've noticed that this consecration nobody wanted to miss, like even the business people who said, oh, I don't care so much about all this, and neither about the culture nor about the religion or spirituality, they all stood in the queue because they did not want to miss this, so there's something to it. So community rituals can uh, do a lot in the, in the improvement of health, 
like health promotion and prevention, stress reduction, strengthening of relationships within a group and between groups, improving cultural identity, reducing post-traumatic stress disorder, and alleviating somatic symptoms, of course, also. Important therapeutic effects are, just to name a few, the rhythmic stimulation that induces also states of consciousness and gives structure to the people, the rhythm. And the ritual process also enhances the release of endorphins and encephalines, then mobilization of support, you know, very important, the feeling of security and the improvement of mood, and of course also the, the, the physical uh, effects. And just to name one, Robert Dijali, an American uh, ethnologist, and his book was called Body and Emo Emotion. And he says that the rituals, they activate the senses, and this has the potential to wake up a person, to alter the sensory grounds of a spiritless body, as he calls it, and so changes how a person feels. And this was a very important publication because until that time, there was the, the most of discussions were around the cognitive patterns of like the way the shaman goes and to special places. But also in my research, I found out that not many people know that. But this activating the senses, the, the, the multi-sensory experience and, and the rhythm and, and the, the community and the resonance that then uh, exists, uh, this is what people feel. So I think this has really much more importance for the, the ritual and the healing process or strengthening the health than the cognitive uh, patterns and designs. So he says it's a poem or performance's visceral impact rather than the metaphoric structure that affects. So the visceral impact affects the change, you know, because the metaphoric structure many people don't know anymore. So the resonance, of course, is also very important, and, and the more uh, sensory systems are addressed, uh, the more impact, the, the stronger the experience is, or also, as for example, my teacher Günther Bartel says, if there are more um, sensory modes addressed, then it becomes more likely that everyone present can get in tune with that and experience something. So we have this uh, community rituals also in Inner Mongolia in the context of revitalization of shamanism or another winter exorcism uh, in, in Qinghai, you know, there it's very nice because they're painted as tigers and, and, and leopards and they also um, integrate the whole community and all the visitors into it. And this in, um, in the Tyrol, this winter exorcism, uh, which is really more a performance, like you see in the, in the theater. You know? And just at the end, some advantages of traditional healing rituals. They're cheap, I mean, in the economical sense. They're family and community oriented. They're integrative, based on a holistic uh, worldview and concept of the person. They uh, have a somatic, social, and psychological effects at the same time. They uh, present uh, a socially accepted way to cope with problems and acting out. Catharsis plays a big role without losing self-esteem or appreciation in the group. I mean, if you have really strong catharsis in everyday life, you might end up at the psychiatric hospital and lose self-esteem and appreciation in the group. So, and the possibilities to the new, renew the effects, they are there all the time. And it's very easy, and personal growth and development with long-lasting effects take place. I mean, as a personal and also somatic and visceral. So I thank you for attention. <laughs>